Sever has always been a solid build, but it could never quite pack that punch to put it into the S tier, or even really into the A tier. But everything changed this season. Sever received a significant buff that massively increased its damage, and the pet fills in perfectly for Sever's weakness, specifically resource generation. The resource generation from the pet is almost fully enabling this build to work, and I am surprised at how well it's actually working. I would actually prefer this build over Bone Spear for Nightmare 100 farming, and in bossing, the only build that can outperform this for Necromancer is Bone Spear. Minions, Blood Nova, all the other builds are beat out by Sever and Single Target. This is a solid S tier build, and it is incredibly fun to play. To get the most value out of Sever, it's important to understand how it works. So when you cast it, you're going to send a guy out who's going to swing, and then he's going to dash back to you and swing again. So you can see dash, swing, dash back, swing again. And he's going to dash to where you have your cursor, and he's going to dash back to where you are. And what's very important to know is on the dashes, he's also going to do damage. So if I stand over here and cast, you'll see that the first dash does damage, then he swings and does damage, and then he dashes back and hits him again. But if I stand on top of the mob, he's actually going to get hit four times because he's going to get hit on the dash, on the swing, and then on the dash back, and on the swing when he gets back. So to optimize your damage, it's very important to be close to the enemy so that you can pump as much damage as possible. Now that we've kind of seen how Sever works, let's get into the skill tree and start talking about the build. So I'm going to be running Reap with Acolyte's Reap. Once again, uh, the attack speed, the corpse generation, the damage reduction, this just does everything. And it's the best essence generator on top of it. This is just the best basic skill. We're going to be putting three points into Hued Flesh for corpse generation, for casting corpse tendrils, corpse explosion, all that stuff. And then we're going to be putting one point into Unliving Energy, and we only have two points to put into Imperfectly Balanced, but we're still going to get the 10% damage multiplier. And, you know, there's some things you could potentially move around to get the third point, but I think this is generally the best setup. We're going to be putting five points into Sever, and then we're going to be taking Paranormal Sever for the Vulnerable Application. This ends up actually being pretty decent, and we end up getting quite a bit of uptime on Vulnerable just from Sever itself. Which, I actually thought this was going to suck, but I actually found this to be pretty, pretty strong. I like that ability. Next, we're putting one point into Corpse Explosion. We're going all the way to Blighted Corpse Explosion. We are running the Sacrilege Ring, and this is going to auto-cast Corpse Explosions, and we want it to be a Shadow skill to proc all of our Shadow effects. We'll get into more of that later, but for now, that's all you need to know. We're going to be putting one point into Grim Harvest. Every time the Sacrilege Corpse Explosions, we'll gain two Essence, which is pretty nice. And then three points into Field by Death for the Damage Multiplier. We're putting three points into Death's Embrace. This will make us tankier and do more damage. It's perfect. And this is a melee build, so we definitely want it. And then we're going to be putting one point into Decrepify, going all the way to Abhorrent Decrepify. I just love this in every single build. It's cooldown reduction on our Bone Storm, and it's cooldown reduction on uh, Corpse Tendril. So this just is incredibly powerful. And then we pair that with Amplify Damage for the Damage Multiplier. We're going to be running Corpse Tendrils, and with played Corpse Tendrils, folder Vulnerable Application. So Corpse Tendrils ends up being a really important piece of this build, in part because we're running the Aspect of Grasping Veins, which is going to give us crit chance and crit damage against the enemies affected by Corpse Tendrils, but also because it's going to apply a slow and a stun, and it's also going to perfectly group enemies for us to cleave them down with the Sever. So... The stun damage is going to be coming from Terror. So Terror is going to give us a damage multiplier against stunned and slowed enemies. So uh, Corpse Tendrils will proc both of these effects, which is awesome. So it's going to give us a nice damage buff. Reaper's Pursuit is going to give us 15% movement speed every time we use a Darkness skill, which is all the time. And then uh, Gloom is going to give us up to 18% bonus damage against enemies, which is fantastic. This is so much damage. This is definitely what you want on your necklace if you can get it, is Ranks of Gloom. We're also going to be running Crippling Darkness. This will give our Darkness skills a chance to stun, which is going to proc Terror, and it's also going to help us stagger bosses. Ends up being very useful. We're putting three points into Inspiring Leader for a 12% attack speed buff. We can easily afford the Essence cost, and so this extra attack speed ends up being extremely strong. And then we're going to be putting three points into Standalone for the damage reduction, three points into Momentum Mori for the sacrifice bonuses on our Skeletons and Mages. Finally, we're going to be taking Bone Storm, with Prime Bone Storm and Supreme Bone Storm, the extra crit chance, the shield generation with Aspect of Shieldly Storm, and the flat damage reduction for Bone Storm is just unparalleled by everything in the game. This is just so freaking good. For our key passive, we're going to be taking Shadow Blight. So the Shadow Blight damage itself ends up not being a huge deal, 
but we're running this because we're running the blight aspect. So after we proc Shadow Blight 10 times, we're going to get 120% bonus damage. So we have to take Shadow Blight, even though it's not really doing too much for us. Uh, moving on to the Book of the Dead, we're going to be sacrificing Skirmishers for 5% crit chance. We're going to be sacrificing Cold Mages for 15% against Vulnerable. And then we're going to be sacrificing the Iron Golem for 30% crit damage. So you can see we actually have quite a bit working towards crit. And in part, it's because I'm running the Grandfather, but even without the Grandfather, this is still your best option. And you will see I am running three Uber Uniques, which is partly why the build looks so strong, but I assure you that the non-Uber version will still clap. And I will tell you all of the replacements, but let's start talking about the gear. So I'm running Harlequin. Obviously, you probably don't have Harlequin. So what you want to run instead is the Aspect of Might, and you want Maximum Life, Lucky Hit while you have a Barrier, and Cooldown Reduction. And your last act can be intelligence or whatever. It's not a big deal. On your chest piece, we're running the Aspect of Shielding Storm. And you just want three damage reduction stats on your chest piece. And then you can either run another damage reduction stat or intelligence for the bonus damage or just maximum life for the health. All of those are good options depending on how tanky you already are. On your gloves, we're going to be running the Aspect of Blighted. Which is going to give us a 120% damage multiplier after we proc Shadow Blight 10 times. This is an incredibly powerful effect. As an AoE, we can keep this up all the time. This is one of the big things that lets this build compete with Bone Storm for Nightmare Dungeon clear time because it's so easy to keep up this 120% damage buff. On our gloves, we're going to be looking for attack speed, lucky hit, crit chance, and ranks of sever. My gloves suck, but that's what you want. On the pants, we're running Juggernauts. Juggernauts is just fantastic. Such a good aspect. We're running triple damage reduction stats, and then I'm running crowd control and pair duration. You don't have to run that. You can run another damage reduction, or you can run intelligence, or whatever you want. I prefer the crowd control duration reduction so that I can keep up my damage and not be affected by crowd control. On boots, we're running flicker steps. These are decent. I'm not fully sold on these. The main reason I'm running them is just because we need the uptime of Bone Storm, but I hate not having that movement aspect on my boots. But I think that this is still a really good option. They have movement speed on them. They have damage reduction from close. They're very solid. And every time we evade through enemies, it's going to reduce the cooldown of Bone Storm. So ultimately, I think Flicker Step is going to be the best option for now. But there's an alternative setup that we'll talk about in a minute where you don't run Flicker Step. On my weapon, I'm running Grandfather. But instead of Grandfather, what I would suggest you do, because I actually think... So this setup I'm about to tell you is actually better than running Grandfather where you put the Aspect of Ultimate Shadow on your gloves, which will turn your Bone Storm into a Darkness skill, so then it can actually proc the Blighted Aspect, then you put a two-handed Blighted Aspect on your weapon, and you'll be crushing damage. It, it's going to, that setup will kill bosses like twice as fast as my setup does right now, uh, but this is just the setup I killed the boss with, but I think that setup was about twice as good. It's so freaking good. So, uh, the other thing that you could do is you could actually wear a Lidless Wall in your offhand, and put a blighted aspect on a one-handed weapon. This is going to be extremely good uh, for dungeons, as it will give you 100% uptime on Bone Storm without having to run Flicker Step. So now you can swap your Flicker Step to something like um, Wind Strikes, where you get movement speed every time you crit, right? And so that setup is also extremely competitive. I think all three setups are totally viable. It's up to you which one you want to play. It won't change anything aside from your aspects. So moving on, on our necklace. We're looking for movement speed and cooldown reduction. Those are the two most important things. And the third thing that we really want is ranks of gloom, which will be our best damage multiplier, but any damage multiplier passive is fine. And for the final stat, I'm running crowd control paired duration. Uh, again, I just love the stat for a class with no unstoppable, but you could run something like, you know, damage reduction or uh, more damage, whatever you want to run. But I prefer crowd control duration reduction. So, on the ring, I'm running the Ring of Starless Skies. This ring is gigabis. It's insane how good this ring is. But you can run the Ring of the Long Shadow, which will give you completely infinite essence in AoE. It'll give you an absurd amount of essence in AoE, way more than the Star of the Sky will give you. So this is a very good alternative. On that ring, you're going to want crit chance, lucky hit chance, maximum life, and resource generation. We're also going to be running the Sacrilege Soul. This item has become almost mandatory in every build. It is so good. It's got the lucky hit, it's got max life, and those both of those stats are fantastic to have a, on a ring, but the main reason why we're running it 
is for the auto casting corpse skills. It's going to auto cast corpse explosion, which has a ton of synergies with the build, as we've kind of already seen in the paragon tree, or I'm sorry, in the skill tree. And the auto casting corpse tendrils is amazing for proccing the aspect of grasping veins. It is just fantastic. It's going to increase the uptime by a lot. It's going to increase our clear speed. It's just so good. In terms of gems, I'm running Topaz in all of my gear. This is for damage reduction while crowd controlled because we don't have access to Unstoppable. Blood Mist is, in my opinion, not worth running. It is a totally unnecessary skill. I can't do damage while I'm in it. I don't like it. I would much rather just run crowd control impairment duration reduction and then run Topaz in my gear. That way, if I get crowd controlled, it's 30% shorter and I'm invincible while I'm crowd controlled. On our weapon, we're going to be running Emeralds for critical strike damage against Vulnerable. As you can see, this build is all about getting the highest crit chance possible. And we're also going to have a lot of uptime on Vulnerable, so this ends up being our best gems for the weapon. On the jewelry, I am running Whites to get to Resistance Cap. If you end up getting over Resistance Cap, sometimes you can fit in a Skull, but usually you're just going to need all three Resistances. Let's talk about the Construct, which is one of the most important pieces of the build. So we're going to be running the Genesis, Duration Support, Tactical Support, Flash of Adrenaline combo you guys have probably become very used to. This is going to give us 100% uptime on 50% damage. So this, these four powers combined is just a 50% damage increase. It's pretty much required in every build. It's so good. Now, we're also going to be running Tempest, which again has become very common. It has a one second cooldown, so it's casting every single second, and it's ranged so he doesn't have to move. So it's the fastest casting skill, and he doesn't have to move to cast it. Why is that so important? Well, the first thing is that he's going to be giving us crit chance against everything he tags. So with this, plus the aspect of grasping veins, plus everything else, we should be near 100% crit chance. We're not quite there, but we're really close. If Bonestorm is up, we're there. Then we're going to be running Evernight, which is going to give us plus four all. So this is a second Harlequin Crest with 100% uptime. So this is absolutely amazing. And then, arguably the most important power is the resource support here. Every single time he casts, which is once a second, we're going to get back 16 resources. This is going to allow us to spam in single target. It's going to let us spam in AoE. It is insane how good this power is. I would argue that without this, I don't think Sever would be rated nearly as high as it is. This is a crucial piece of the build. Let's talk about the Paragon board for this build. What we're aiming for is as much damage as possible. We've already got a lot of survivability. We just need to finish capping our resistances, get a little bit of armor, and then as much damage as we can find. So we're taking Amplify here because it's going to buff the armor nodes, and it's also going to give us a 10% damage multiplier. Uh, coming up here, we're taking Excavation. So this is used only for the Fortify generation because every time we cast Corpse Explosion or Corpse Tendrils, we're going to get Fortify. So this is going to be one of the only defensive glyphs that we run, and it's going to give us a ton of damage reduction because that Fortify is so valuable. Up here, we're running Control. So this is going to give us a 20% damage multiplier against frozen enemies. And I always get this question when I run this board of why I take Overload. Uh, Overlord, it's just, it's the same thing. It's two points for 10 intelligence, which is, you know, more efficient than any other way you can get the intelligence. So I just want to answer that question now. Coming over here, we're taking Flesh Eater for the massive damage buff. This is partly what makes a Sacrilege so freaking good is because it's going to be constantly eating corpses to proc the Flesh Eater buff. So we're going to have a very good uptime on 40% damage, especially in AoE situations. Here we're taking Abyssal. So this is just going to give us a 10% uh, damage multiplier. And then coming down here, we're going to be taking Sacrificial. And so Sacrificial is going to give us another 10%. And it's also going to have 150% bonus to all magic nodes, which again is going to hit these armor nodes. So you can see we're getting closer and closer to armor cap. And we're taking Scent of Death. So ideally, Scent of Death is going to be constantly eating corpses for the 15% damage buff. But we will sometimes have the damage reduction. But at least when we first enter a pull, we'll have a damage buff. So the first couple of scythes will hit very hard. Coming over to this tree, we're going to be taking Scourge. This will give us a 10% damage multiplier. The additive effect isn't that useful, but the 10% damage makes it worth taking. And that's pretty much the Paragon board, and that's the build. Um, I was shocked at how good Scythe was. I hope that you guys have the sim similar success with it as what I found. And if you did, please let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, let me know. Leave a like and a comment. And thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Minions. That's what's next.